Good afternoon. Surveillance of marginalized communities and those living on social assistance has occurred throughout history, but it's arguably becoming more pervasive, automated, and invasive. What kind of impacts do these highly publicized tools have on public perceptions of those living on social assistance and the subjectivity of those subjected to these surveillance practices, platforms? As David Lyon explains, surveillance can be understood broadly as the focused, systematic, and routine attention to personal details for purposes of influence, management, protection, or direction. In other words, in addition to observing, surveillance practices also exert influence and reproduce power relations through technological and non-technological means. In the 1960s and 70s in Montreal, Quebec, it wasn't uncommon, in fact it was fairly common, for a social worker to suddenly show up unannounced at the home of a welfare recipient. Commonly it would be a single mother. And do a physical actual search of the home to see if she could find or he could find any evidence of a man being in the residence. If so, the single mother would then be considered guilty of welfare fraud, as the assumption was, and still is today in many places, that the male must be contributing in some way financially. These old school type of methods for tracking and detecting welfare fraud had been replaced, or in some cases supplemented, with new tools and technological platforms, drawing on informal data streams and large databases to detect possible cases of fraud and take away social assistance from those flagged individuals. For example, despite the fact that estimates of the welfare rate fraud place it at around 0.03% in Canada and two point something in the United States, the government of Ontario, for example, continues to be increasingly aggressive in its surveillance and punishment of welfare cheats. And unfortunately, the Ontario government is not alone or unique in this practice, of course. These so-called welfare cheats are often flagged through the use, for example, of programs such as the Consolidated Verification Process, CVP, a province-wide dat database that used to identify risk factors to identify people living on social assistance as potential frauds. These risk factors, they could be anything from a change in a relationship status to pursuing educational opportunities, so going back to school would flag you right away as a potential fraud suspect. Of course, this just served to individualize the problem of poverty through the specter of fraud by the use of an ever-widening net of surveillance practices. Similar databases and surveillance tools are also being used in the United States, England, Australia, and other countries. And I'm looking at one from each of those countries. This paper examines these digital fraud tracking tools, including SAMS, which is the Social Assistance Management System sorry, social assistant management system that was created to update and replace Ontario's CVP and was launched in November 2014. Also the basic cards in, in Australia, which limits, controls, and tracks every purchase made by those on social assistance. And similar cashless debit card systems are being used in the United States and UK. Although surveillance by the state is not new, the scope and scale of the practice increased significantly in Western nations after 9-11, thanks to the fear-mongering of the Bush administration. This transformation launched the surveillance industry into the limelight in the war on terrorism and had massive implications and ripple effects on marginalized communities. For example, sweeping changes to privacy laws were often accepted without much consideration for how these modern surveillance systems, and as Monaghan posits, quote, amplify existing social inequalities and reproduce regimes of control and or exclusion of marginalized groups, end of quote. This, of course, is adding to the stigmatization of marginalized groups and presenting them as risky and threats to national security, even though the effectiveness in the war on terror, for, uh, terror from this enormous increase in surveillance has never been validated. Although 9-11 encouraged and legitimized the acceleration of numerous surveillance programs, it also did bring to light some trends that had previously been developing below the radar and had gone mostly unnoticed. For example, as Eubank posits, the inequalities that are, quote, deeply encoded, end of quote, in surveillance practices mean that those who live in poverty are singled out for more aggressive scrutiny and are often criminalized. Since marginalized communities often lack power and political clout, they are often, as Eubank suggests, claims, 
uh, suggests, the testing grounds for surveillance technologies, including repressive social programs. So we're taking some of the most vulnerable people in our community and using them as the testing ground. Surveillance, of course, is about power, control, self-determination, and autonomy. And when it comes to those living in poverty, Berger, Eubanks, and Mackey argue that increased surveillance of those receiving social assistance is justified in order to force welfare recipients off welfare and into the job market. When SAMS was first rolled out in Ontario, its estimated cost, for example, was just under $250 million. This new program was going to be more cost effective, save tax dollars, and also be more efficient in the delivery of services to those, for example, in social assistance. However, thanks to an enormous amount of glitches, the costs quickly increased by an additional $50 million immediately around the launch and continues to climb. Interestingly, about 10 days before SAM's launch date, documents obtained by the Canadian press through a Freedom of Information request show that despite clear evidence to those involved, the executives involved in the program, that the system was in fact not ready to go live, was going to have all kinds of negative consequences and implications for the people who were supposed to be served by this new program, it was decided to launch it anyway. But when it comes to new technologies which are supposed to make welfare payments more efficient, but instead often result in long waits, missed payments, and further humiliation to some of the most vulnerable populations, of course Ontario is not alone. For example, in 2014, government computers kept crashing after North Car Carolina decided to use a new program that meant combining food stamps, Medicare, and several other welfare programs into a single computer system. A spokeswoman for the State Department of Health and Human Services explained in an interview that they simply hadn't had enough time to properly test the system. That meant thousands of families, some of them for as long as eight months, went without their food stamps and had trouble accessing health care. So they didn't have time to properly test the system, but they launched it anyway. According to David Super, the real issue is that these computer errors are not a priority to correct often taking months and even years to properly address because, quote, technology for poor people is not considered a high priority, end of quote. A state auditor found that in a review of 84 government uh, IT projects in North Carolina over the past decade, on average, they cost twice as much and took one year longer than originally estimated. That's not unusual with these platforms. Myths around welfare fraud are used to justify surveillance systems that, according to Mackey, in turn act to reframe social problems, quote, in relation to market forces to force recipients into low-paying precarious labor, end of quote. Misconceptions and negative stereotypes about the poor also mean a lack of public support or increased pressure for timely action from state official when it comes to fixing problems such as the one that occurred in the United States when some of the states switched over to a computer program that led to thousands and thousands of welfare recipients, including children, having to go without food. Where was the public outcry in response to this? There is increasing concern and recognition of how digital surveillance and big data collection may operate outside of democratic processes as the technology is developing so rapidly, it's outpacing ethical considerations and targeting often creates and reinforces social divisions and inequality. For example, according to Gandhi, surveillance is often used as a way to manipulate public opinion and according to Henman and Marson and Lyon, to reinforce existing stereotypes about those living in poverty and ethnic minority groups through social sorting. This means that surveillance has led to the creation of separate groups of people based on things such as gender, ethnicity, and income, and suggests the proclivity for surveillance structures to default to societal differentiation and then regulating these populations based on their determined ranking or status, something we would never be allowed to do outside of that system at least not openly. As Lyon and others have argued, this can then lead to troubling decisions by the state based on profiling and prediction policy, based on the assumptions that data collected through surveillance suggests whatever it suggests about the potential behavior of those in each group. As Bud, Lyon, and Monaghan suggest, for those assigned to a group which predicts criminal or other antisocial behavior, remember criminal behavior in welfare recipients, if you were to examine how they define welfare fraud or criminal behavior, you'd be shocked. It's, not, it's probably not at all what most of us think of as really fraud, uh, fraud or criminal behavior. Fraud would be if you are on welfare and you're babysitting a neighbor's kid for a couple of hours a week. That's fraud if you're caught. And if you're convicted of fraud in welfare, you could go to jail, and as a minimum, you'd lose your welfare pay. 
payments, possibly for life. The consequences can be enormous and potentially devastating as one is determined to be outside the group of citizens most valued and empowered by the state, raising critical questions in regards to fairness and equity. As previously mentioned, surveillance often leads to people being put into these categories, and it's based on the assumption that they can predict the possibility of negative future behavior, such as criminal acts. This, as Monaghan explains, includes the construction of people in poverty as flawed citizens, as they fail to fit the neoliberal model of consumer citizen, and with their non-consumption consumption being constructed as a form of deviance. And according to Coleman, those who do not consume are monitored and surveilled more closely. As Gary Marx and others point out, none of this is truly new. However, what is new is, quote, the scale, greater precision, continual invention and experimentation, and global connections, end of quote, offering new digital and online ways to control and colonize more modern society. Further, although discrimination based on race and gender has been increasingly outlawed through the increasingly targeted forms of surveillance today, digital surveillance and big data collection, as I was hinting about before, is offering new and mostly unchecked ways to discriminate against already marginalized groups. This includes the basic card system in Australia, which also adds extra stress and stigmatization to the clients who use it. Both of these programs can be examined through the surveillance assemblage. We are using a range of platforms that are all surveilling us to the point that it's no longer accurate to speak of being surveilled, but rather we are being surveilled across a system of nodes and networks, flow of information as we are tracked and followed across an assembly of platforms and services. Surveillance and welfare has expanded the state's power to regulate, monitor, and control people in poverty. This includes surveillance as a tool for intimidation, stigmatization and humiliation of the poor, as demonstrated, for example, by mandatory urine tests, fingerprints, surprise home visits, which continue today. In 2017, you can still have a social worker show up at your house and have entry. And even the specific language of welfare support in Ontario, if you go online and look at how do you apply for welfare. Many scholars argue that there's a deliberate move through policy making and governance from welfare fraud to welfare as fraud, the construction of surveillance apparatus to monitor these, those living on welfare, and the myth of welfare fraud forces recipients into low paying precarious work to ensure a sufficient supply of labor. Such tools in conjunction with welfare fraud myths and blaming discourses allow the state to discipline and regulate the poor with little to no public scrutiny, judgment, or accountability. Olson Gregg argues that social inequality is created, reproduced, institutionalized, legitimized, and perpetuated by the people who hold the most resources in society. As Gilliam posits, in order to govern or control people who live in poverty, first the state must know them. And in order to do that, the state must put them into knowable categories. These often repressive forms of surveillance of welfare recipients includes using a card that allows uh, recipients to purchase only pre-approved items. In addition to being able to track, surveil, and collect massive amounts of personal information, this program also suggests, obviously, an inherent lack of trust in those living in poverty, revealing just one of the ways the state creates deviance out of those who are not good consumers in a capitalist society, since, as Campbell argues, spending money is, quote, the main means of social integration and participation in a con consumer democracy, end of quote. Or as Elaine uh, Power has argued, those who are on social assistance are constructed as flawed consumers since their lack of an income and jobs make them unable to participate in consumer society. Interestingly, this inequality and in regulation of the poor occurs despite the fact that revenue law through ta tax evasion vastly exceeds the loss of any money through welfare fraud. Where's the moral outrage and public demands for accountability? and punishment of those in the upper class who have mastered the art of tax evasion? Why do we seem to admire those who brag about not paying any taxes, seeing it as somehow some kind of evidence of their cleverness at being able to beat the system? Yet we seem to have so much contempt and suspicion of those living in poverty. Monaghan posits that surveillance data mining set people up for examination and control because, quote, these systems are closed and they resist opportunities for democratic participation and how they are designed, used, critiqued, or regulated, end of quote. In other words, new technologies are permitting surveillance techniques to get way ahead of ethical considerations and acts outside of our normative values about democracy, 
discrimination, and social justice, assigning value and risk in advance based purely on statistical probabilities. As Monaghan suggests, this all serves to reproduce, or rather to produce, neoliberal subjects who approach the world through the eyes of the consumer, rather than those citizens entitled to rights. End of quote. In conclusion. <laughs> Although this paper is still very much a work in progress and the research is ongoing, <coughs> an examination of these four different platforms um, across uh, in four different countries did reveal some commonalities and plenty of troubling facts. Although they're always initially pitched to the public as a way to save money for taxpayers, we're going to save money, we're going to catch the fakes, we're going to expose them, so of course it's pitched as a wonderful thing as far as the public's concerned, they also say we'll be able to serve the targeted clientele better, the people who really deserve it. So of course the public gets on board with that because of all the myths surrounding welfare fraud. Um, all of them contribute to the further marginalization and humiliation of people in poverty, people who are among the most vulnerable. So they certainly share that in common. But some of the other things that I find interesting is so they're supposed to save money and make lives easier for the people they're helping. And yet in every single case that I've looked at so far, they all have glitches, glitches that affect the people they're supposed to be helping. And all of them run into all kinds of financial trouble, costing more than they were initially pitched as supposedly, supposedly to cost. And the costs that any of them do represent are from exposing people as frauds, who, again, you might not agree that those are people who are fraudulent, um, and making it almost impossible for some people to even know how to apply for welfare anymore. They're making that increasingly more difficult and challenging for those people who need to access the system. Uh, they're also creating all kinds of uh, long wait times. So, in other words, all the stuff that they're claiming to do, they're not doing it. So my further research, of course, is going to look at, so why are we doing this? Why do we continue to do it? Thank you. OK, the, the keen-eyed amongst you may realize that I've changed the end of my title. I like to endlessly, rather than do anything sort of useful, improve the, improve the presentation, I just like to tinker with the title. So it, between individual and collective rights claims is how I'm, how I'm sort of uh, finishing off the, the, this idea. Um, so uh, as will be discussed in great detail over the next couple of days, indicators abound that we are living under a regime of data power. We only need to look as far as the, the way the votes were manipulated in the Brexit and recent US presidential uh, elections by micro-targeting, um, how data platforms have become the highest valued companies in the world, or how governments further their agenda of securitization through increased data capture. Power increasingly is materialized through data and the capacity to store, capture and analyze more of it. And as this power accumulates in the hands of a few state and corporate entities, these become the sites of authority of a regime of data power. We can think of this as built on the foundations laid by the architects of informational capitalism. But the novelty of data power is that it moves beyond just the commodification of information and at its core relies on the aggregation of data. Now we are the subjects that live within this regime. Um, and as the literature on citizenship studies tells us, subjects become citizens when they submit rights claims to sites of authority. The figure that emerges from this activity is one that we can call the data citizen, one brought into being through their relationship to processes of datification. Um, those, those are the acts, um, uh, rather than just the acts performed in cyberspace, which was the basis of the, of the, of the, uh, the netizen. This, however, is, is an inchoate figure. It's one whose full profile is still to be gleaned. Fundamentally, the performance of data citizenship has not kept pace with the evolution of data power. What I want to do is to shed light on this emerging political actor by looking back at an earlier mode of citizenship, one occupied by the netizen or digital citizen. I believe by doing this, we can better understand the relationship between the data, cit data citizen and the regime of data power. So right at the outset, I want to refer to the, the brilliant analysis of, analysis of digital citizenship uh, by Issen and Rupert, uh, because they've done more than most to further our understanding what it is that constitutes the figure of the digital citizen. They contend that performing rights claims on and through the internet is at the essence of digital citizenship. And moreover, this makes the digital citizen both a subversive and a submissive figure. 
She makes demands in that sense subversive, but in doing so she expresses a willingness to submit to that authority. It is in their words the paradox of freedom through submission. It's my contention that the rights claims performed by both the digital citizen and her successor, the data citizen, and the dominant imaginaries that accompany these acts are best defined as submissive to power rather than subversive of it. It's submissive because the claimed rights so often fail to connect to broader social struggles, but also because at a fundamental level they consolidate rather than check the sweep of data power. And why is this important? Because I believe that this new generation of civic rights carves out too small a space of autonomy and freedom. And by offering only a, a semblance of resistance, I argue that they, they sap vital energy from alternative projects that could viably realign data power to serve rather than challenge democratic norms. To make this case, I'm going to proceed in three stages. First, I want to look back at the proliferation of charters of communication rights, from the WESIS process, which I believe constituted a watershed moment, to the present day. Next, I identify the, the core demands that feature in many of these charters and make the case for how they go with rather than against the grain of informational capitalism. Finally, I'll relate these to the emerging patterns of data rights claims and identify those alternative approaches which I believe the genuine promise of subversion. So, I don't have much time to elaborate on this point. In fact, it, it could very well be a standalone presentation. But I, I believe that if we look back at the uh, World Summit on the Information Society, WESIS, in 2003 and 2005, we can identify a major turning point for how the dominant understanding of communication rights changed. It shifted away from one focused on defending a collective good through systemic change, one that was articulated in a really vibrant way during the Nwaiko debates of the 1970s, towards one framed around mitigating harm to the individual within the boundaries of a commercial system. As many scholars have demonstrated, most notably Lisa McLaughlin and Victor Picard, the WISIS process coincided with the high watermark of information society rhetoric, as well as with neoliberalism firmly entrenched as political economic orthodoxy. And the second phase of the process also took place in 2005, as Web 2.0 and the, the accompanying cyber libertarian discourses were reaching a crescendo. This all meant that technocratic, market-friendly, individualist solutions would become the officially prescriptive means to realize the information society. The emancipatory power of technology and its invisible corollary, the market, would resolve all of the challenges implied by the information age. There would be little accommodation of the kinds of radical, collectivist and redistributive demands that characterised the Nwaiko process of 20 years earlier. Those lessons had been well learned. Proponents of more substantive communication rights were certainly present, such as the Chris campaign, but their demands were marginalised in one civil society resolution. One of its chief architects, Sean Osukru, demonstrated its radical character in this quote. It confronts key dangers... <clears throat> Excuse me, such as excessive copyright protection and monopolies on IP, concentration of media ownership and the limitations of a purely market-driven approach. It's significant, meanwhile, that the main outcome of the formal process was the creation of a multi-stakeholder forum for internet governance. This represented the archetype of a technocratic, neutral, system-friendly resolution, one thoroughly infiltrated by the discursive logics of neoliberalism and informationism. And that's a cocktail that Erin Fisher describes as the digital discourse. I contend that the internet intellectual lineage for communication rights forked at this point. One branches out from the Weiss's Civil Society Declaration towards a robust but very marginalised conception of communication rights. The other leads us to what Issen and Rupert describe as a veritable digital rights movement. This became the dominant imaginary for for communication rights and has led to the creation of more than 20 charters in the last 10 years. I'm going to show you just a, a cherry-picked sample of those now. Uh, so you've got quite, quite a variety. You've got those that, that, come, uh, that occur within a national legislation uh, like Brazil and Italy. You've got those that were created by advocacy groups like Tech Freedom and those that have been created within multi-stakeholder organisations like the IGF. Um, I've highlighted here charters of digital rights that attempt a broad sweep of duties, rights, and obligations, um, what Gil, Rodecker, and Gasser refer to as digital constitutionalism. And I've done this because I think they offer a much more fulsome uh, depiction of what the digital citizen is or what, it's, what she's imagined to be, 
rather than any single issue rights claims. I want to look now at the content of these bills. Um, those authors I just mentioned are researchers at the Berkman Centre for Internet and Society. They've done a lot of the heavy lifting in this regard. A couple of years ago, they published a paper analysing the content of many of these charters. And they ad identify seven broad groups. Fundamental freedoms, which are sort of classical offline rights that are applied to the internet. Um, general limits on state power. Internet governance. Privacy rights and surveillance. Access and education. Openness and stability of networks. And economic rights and responsibilities. Painting in the same broad strokes, I argue that these themes are characterised by an emphasis on individual and technical market-based fixes. They are also marked by what they lack, which is any confrontation with the hyper-commercialism of the internet or demands for anything approaching a systemic challenge to its political economy. Finally, I agree with Marianne Franklin's observation that online rights are encapsulated by the trope of freedom. She doesn't really go on to develop this point, but I think we're well served to look at David Harvey's work on neoliberal rhetoric. He shows how it systematically conflates personal liberty with market freedom. This serves the purpose of fragmenting the forces ranged in pursuit of social justice by splitting off libertarianism, multiculturalism, identity politics, and co-opting them for the neoliberal project. I believe that the empty signifier of freedom serves a similar function in charters of digital rights, on one hand, it permits the easy conflation of individual rights with the free flow of information and openness that's essential for the processes of accumulation within informational capitalism. And on the other, it forestalls connections to broader social justice concerns. If we can realize freedom through these rights, why go any further? I'll go on to develop this point by looking in more detail at three of the most frequently occurring and arguably iconic digital rights. Uh, privacy, net neutrality, and freedom of expression. So privacy is a venerable concept with a lineage that can be traced back to ancient Greece. Two connotations from its distant past are, are germane to us here. One lies in the etymology of the word, as in Latin, privus means single, hinting at its inherently individualistic nature. Moreover, privacy is synonymous with private property, a connection we can trace back to the work of Locke. So in a modern workaday sense, Privacy concerns the rights of the individual to control the information that is disseminated about herself. This concept has acquired particular salience in the light of the Snowden revelations regarding the extent of government dragnet surveillance, though the appearance of privacy in many, in many of the charters I've mentioned here actually predates Snowden. So my concerns with privacy as a landmark digital right follow some of the well-established critiques offered by surveillance scholars such as John Gilliam, and Priscilla Reagan, who argue that the concept as framed by the privacy regime is hyper-individualistic, legalistic, and fails to actually confront the surveillance regime that it purports to, to rebuff. And as Gilliam reminds us, privacy is not, in fact, the ontological antithesis of surveillance. And by framing it as if it were, much of the social damage wrought by surveillance goes unchecked. Now, we need to translate these critiques into the digital realm by seeing that fr privacy framed as data protection aims to protect our data doubles, that amalgamation of digital acts that exists somewhere out there in the cloud, but that inadequately protect our democratic freedoms threatened by surveillance. Also, by promoting individualistic and privatized digital uh, pr privacy techniques, the enormous power imbalance between the opaque and labyrinthine repositories of data and the individual citizen is obfuscated. It's something that Jonathan Obar describes as the fallacy of data privacy self-management. It's this fallacy that I believe ultimately serves to preserve the titans of informational capitalism. And by protecting personal data as property, this fights the battle of privacy on capital's preferred terrain, which is that of information as commodity. Thus, any victory will be partial at best. Um, I'll move on now to freedom of expression. Uh, which is a classic first-generation negative right, uh, most famously codified in Article 19 of the, of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And this is the freedom to impart information without interference. Safeguarding human expression from government filtering and blocking is, of course, hugely important. However, in its dominant framing as a negative right, freedom of expression obfuscates the structural conditions in which communication actually occurs. This is especially so as the expressive capacities of netizens were sublimated in the, the whole Web 2.0 celebrations and the cyber-libertarian discourses that came with it. 
According to these judgments, online platforms would nullify the old media gatekeepers and give netizens the capacity to freely create and express themselves. This discourse framed freedom of expression as an individual rather than a collective value and exerted a profound influence on many of the charters of digital rights that emerged from the mid-2000s. The internet is in fact a hyper-commercial space and the main platforms for communication are based on ad-driven data valence. As, have been, as has been recognized by many observers, um, this distorts free speech by channeling it through architectures and algorithms designed to maximize data capture, ad exposures, and ultimately revenue. The extraordinary concentration of online ownership turns the platform behemoths into gatekeepers with enormous power over regulating speech. The right to free expression does not address these structural political economic constraints, and with an overemphasis on state actors, tech companies of Silicon Valley can get a free ride. As Victor Picard wrote recently in his call for a people's internet, freedom of speech requires a proactive state to help create the necessary conditions, especially within media systems governed by commercial logic. The most critical reading of freedom of expression as a fundamental digital right is indeed that it elides personal emancipation with the systemic needs of informational capital. The expressive capacities of netizens provides the basic raw material which, from which profits are generated online. As José van Dijk argues, the organization of social exchange is staked on neoliberal economic principles. And so the last core, core right I want to look at is net neutrality. Um, so this is the requirement that all data be treated equally as it moves over the network. It's impossible to dispute that the end-to-end -end principle is a hugely important dimension of the Internet's architecture. Without it, much of the free access to information and technical innovation that we, we think about in terms of the Internet would be, would be lost. So it's not the fact of net neutrality that I'm concerned about. It's its elevation to a top-tier digital right and how this techno-legal policy measure sucks the oxygen out of more substantive rights claims. The implicit argument in much advocacy work in favour of net neutrality is that so long as the neutrality of the network is preserved, then the internet will be doing just fine. This once again negates the commercialisation, commodification and concentration of the online environment. This is a point that Russell Newman makes brilliantly in his article on the neoliberal roots of net neutrality. He says that the concept promotes an online market-based survival of the fittest. Um, the internet in this framing becomes a calculative engine to ferret out the best and eliminate the rest. And if we think about the struggle over net neutrality in another way, it actually becomes an intra-capitalist turf war that pits big telco versus web companies as to which sector profits most from the internet. In those countries that have enshrined neutrality as a digital right, such as Brazil, it's hard to deny that some of the big winners have been Google and Facebook with all of the implications that entails for democratic communication online. And once again, referring to Newman, by keeping the main fight over the soul of the internet on the terrain of net neutrality, the idea, for instance, of a structural separation framework, one in which conduit and service will be kept apart to safeguard democratic communication, one that's ultimately much more damaging to the telco's bottom line, is kept off the table. So, I would argue that these digital charters are populated by rights claims that are predominantly individualist, techno-legal, and that not only do not adequately confront the political, economy, uh, political economic structure of the internet, but in fact, in some important ways, actually strengthen the power holders within the system. In sum, these digital rights are not the problem, but in the form that I've presented them, I don't believe they, they offer the solution either. They offer the potential for a series of fixtures, but not victory. So whether the alternative, um, I've, I've collated a few of what I think are the most compelling ideas and a, and a few of the, the sources where you can find these ideas elaborated. So the idea of a tax on data uh, that you can find in Powers and Jablonski, the government provision of online public journalism, Chesney and Picard, uh, this platform cooperativism, cooperativism uh, which is really gaining ground right now, uh, municipal and community broadband networks, sustainable culture that Astra Taylor sort of has created a manifesto for, the Human Knowledge Project, and the Distributive Digital Commons. Um, and this, this rather meandering path takes us back to the data citizen, the, the, the purported subject of this talk, after all. 
Um, and the rights claims that, that constitute this nascent figure, predominantly based around privacy and encryption measures, as well as personal data silos, I believe follow a similar trajectory to digital rights, in that they're too liberal individualist, reliant on techno-legal solutionism, and focused exclusively on negative rights, and divorced from a wider progressive agenda. I wouldn't presume to advance an alternative agenda at this point, uh, though I'll be very keen to see what Arnie Hintz and his colleagues at the Data Justice Lab come up with. Um, but I do think that the fate of the netizen is a cautionary tale for the data citizen. Uh, the mushroom, mushrooming of digital rights has not checked the spread of informational capitalism, but may in fact have fueled its rise. Where we pe can perhaps derive hope, and that, that's why I've ended on, on the icon of the sun here, derive hope for the future is in the growing emphasis on a social critique of capitalism generally, one that seeks transformation rather than accommodation, and that perhaps this approach to social justice claims will reorient to the constitution of the data citizen. Thank you. My presentation goes on on a similar subject, um, which I think will be complementary to the critique uh, you addressed. So um, I'm Anne-Sophie Letelier, and I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Quebec in Montreal. I'll be presenting today um, a paper that is part of my broader doctoral research uh, that is on the relationship between conceptualizations of human right, internet infrastructure, um, and activism through the case study of the Icelandic Modern Media Initiative, which has the objective to uh, create a safe haven for information in Iceland. So, when studying the power structure underlying data analysis and data management, it seems like very few works and debates focus on the politics of where and how are stored and managed data. Uh, drawing on that constatation, Hugh argues that um, the data center remains among the least studied areas of digital culture, with ca cloud computing producing a layer of abstraction that masks the physical infrastructure of data storage. Paradoxically, then, the data center exists at the border between the dematerial dematerialized space of data and the resolutely physical buildings they occupy. So, in an increasingly datafied world where data represents forms of power through, uh, for instance, knowledge or economic value, uh, the regulatory frameworks um, of sovereign states have an incidence not only within the borders of the country, but uh, considering the global character of, on the internet, on the ecosystems of network, and their management and the business model and the, that structure basically online services. Yet, the role of data center can resemble, quote, to quote again, uh, Hugh, uh, can resemble a slay a hand trick. The if the cloud is promoted as a centralized entity, uh, to be placeless and borderless, data must first be displaced and be centralized. In this perspective, my doctoral researches uh, focus on the infrastructural aspect of information and data regulation. Sen said differently, um, I'm interested in the moment uh, in which data is constrained from, like, is constrained at one physical and legislative space. So dra drawing on Sandra Bremen's work on information regulation, uh, we can approach data regulation as the interaction of three regulatory fields. First, the government, which refers to the law, public policies, and legislative processes of geopolitically recognized state. Uh, the governance, which refers to formal and informal norms and technical standard implemented by a variety of actors, and governmentality, which, taking up on Foucault, uh, refers to the cultural predisposition that produce and reproduce certain forms of knowledge, hence uh, governments and governance practices. So studies in the field of internet governance and internet policy have shown that both internet policy making um, and governance are increasingly influenced by the power of corporate actors, assuming as multiple uh, scholars in STS, legal study, privacy and surveillance studies, and media studies, that data, code, and infrastructures of network mediate with human rights and civil liberty. I want to address data regulation, uh, namely 
through the infrastructure of data centers and their legislation, I want to say basically that they can potentially be mobilized or instrumentalized by activist-led initiative to promote the interests of citizen. So one of the most documented case is the one of CLAN, which is kind of the libertarian um, ideal of a data haven. So basically, CLAN is a 60-foot uh, abandoned World War II platform in the North Sea, uh, raised about six miles away from the southeast coast of England. Uh, it was adopted as a pirate radio in the 1960s and was declared independent by Roe Bates. Uh, since 2010, it has promoted itself as a data haven, or to quote Bates, an offshore fat pipe data that answers to nobody. Um, praising to offer a legal environment that protects customers' privacy, uh, Sealand offered, according to Hogan and Shepard, more of a metaphor for detached and floating imaginaries of data. Um, evocative of cloud storage and discourses of the immaterial more than an actual solution to proper issues uh, of the location and ownership of data. So there's another similar project um, that I'm focusing on uh, that is to create a data haven um, that is being discussed right now in Iceland. The project was proposed in 2010 and it has been under review uh, since. So it should be uh, discussed more specifically in the present term. Um, so, yeah. So um, the Icelandic Modern Media Initiative uh, is kind of a bundle of laws and regulatory proposal. It's being developed, actualized, and overseen uh, by the Icelandic Modern Media Institute, which is to confuse people, they have exactly the same acronym. So right now I'm just going to refer it as IMI because they're basically the similar thing. So this project emerged following two digital freedom conferences held in Reykjavik in 2008 and 2009. In 2008, the guest speaker, John Perry Barlow, which you probably know because he's the co-founder of the Electronic Frontier Foundation and the author of the Declaration of Independence of Cyberspace, uh, evocated the idea that Iceland should become the Switzerland of bits, a safe haven for information in the world. In 2009, uh, following the economic crisis uh, that ruined Iceland's financial system, the second edition of the Digital Freedom Conference took place. This time, the guest speakers were Michael Schmidt and Julian Assange, the co-founders of WikiLeaks, the famous media organization uh, that published a couple of months earlier the documents revealing corruption practices of three major banks in Iceland and government's officials. So following this conference, a group of activists uh, gathered uh, for a couple of weeks uh, to draft the first version of the IMI. Among these people, we can count, obviously, Julian Assange and Michael Schmidt, uh, Smarri McCarthy, that was the organizer of the Digital Freedom Conference, um, Birgitta Jansatir, a supporter of WikiLeaks uh, that was recently uh, elected a member of the Icelandic parliament, uh, Rob Gonsgrip, with who is a Dutch hacker, and Jacob Applebaum, known for his involvement with WikiLeaks and as a spokesperson for Tor Project. So in this perspective, the IMI is particularly uh, interesting as a case study because it was crafted as a holistic approach to information regulation online by what we can call digital rights activists. Uh, that obviously have strong ties uh, with the hacker culture and the cypherpunk community. Uh, this group and its expertise, technical expertise basically, brings a unique understanding um, and conceptualization of political and ethical issues raised by technology that is otherwise rarely addressed within political and legislative sphere. So the debates in these spheres most of the time are dominated by private actors. And finally, what makes it really interesting is that the smallness of Iceland makes it kind of a really cool lab to test new ideas um, regarding, in this case, internet policy and governance. So in a nutshell, um, the IMI consists in a set of law, regulation, uh, political decision, technical provisions to protect information, journalism in its broader sense, so including uh, blogging in there, uh, political speech, and users' privacy. 
Uh, it brought together what they called the best laws from all over the world, going from whistleblower protection, Freedom of Information Act, uh, source protection, communication protection limiting, among other intermediary responsibility, data retention provisions, uh, prior restraint, history protection, libel law, libel tourism, etc. So this legislative proposal is particularly interesting uh, for many reasons, but most importantly because it offers the possibility to further um, theoretical and practical knowledge on ideological issues related to the information regulation uh, by studying the relationship between governance of digital infrastructure, conceptualization of human rights, and advocacy practices from communities that are involved within digital rights communities. So said differently, I'm interested in the governmentality slash ideological aspect of information regulation and on how uh, knowledge and power structure are contested or potentially reinforced uh, through internet governance and policy making reforms. So this is why drawing on uh, documentary research and interviews with key members of the IMI, I argue that the IMI bears the potential to challenge uh, one popular, oh, did I? Yeah. A popular big data uh, discourse narrative and cypherpunk discourse about technology. Um, first of all, challenging information regulation and big data narratives. So um, at its simplest, the IMI challenges some of the rhetoric underlying the processes enabled by bulk data collection and data retention. In libel law, whistleblower protection, source protection, and journalist protection, uh, people I interviewed uh, we're well aware that many of these activities could potentially be controversial, mostly because it will make it a lot harder to take down content hosted in Iceland. Therefore, it necessarily facilitate and protect the emergence of many uh, disruptive political discourse or just, yeah, uh, website and services that would otherwise be deleted more automatically uh, as an example through breach of term use. So protecting political discourse and the right to privacy necessarily puts the state and its legislative apparatus in a position where it needs to take difficult decision, therefore putting greater importance on the rule of law rather than over the rule of facts dictated by the regulation practices of private companies. Another example would be the limit of data retention according to principles of necessary and proportionate that counteracts the directly that counteracts directly the famous collected all of the NSA. In this perspective, the data haven has, as described by many of the people I interviewed, um, has an objective to make such intervention, so the use of public data or retrieving content online, less automatic, more difficult, and first and foremost, more transparent and open to public debate. This boils down to the fact that surveillance and the trust that we uh, put in data and automatic cybernetic-ish decision is often said to be, um, to have the objective to be frictionless uh, governance. Uh, in this perspective, we can say that the IMI kind of offers uh, the opposite goal. The role of the state is central to the implementation of these law and they are designed to kind of create fiction and to address those friction um, and to have those difficult conversation. Said differently, it brings back kind of a political dimension into the public sphere. Uh, the proeminent role of, of the state also calls for a different understanding and conceptualization of human rights as it tend to present uh, their protection mainly as a positive obligation of the state. Especially the freedom of expression and the right to privacy on which I focus are often criticized by scholar, we can think of Solov, uh, Reagan and Bakken, um, for being rooted in their liberal tradition that atomizes uh, the relationship between the individual, the state and the corporations. More importantly, both the right to privacy and freedom of expression are often understood as negative rights, meaning that they aim to protect the individual from uh, the interference of the state and other actors. Uh, the problem with this conception is that it often fails to recognize and promote the social and political value of such right and freedoms and limit the positive responsibility held by the state to protect uh, the freedom of speech, for instance, through policy that could ensure um, media diversity, etc. 
Uh, so by putting forward this holistic approach to information regulation online and by focusing on provisions towards the protection of politically relevant speech, the ME Furthers, um, further tends to, at least conceptually, rearticulate uh, the interpretation of freedom of speech and privacy as a political common, uh, as theorized by Dardot and Laval. So for Dardot and Laval, the notion of common uh, doesn't refer to a common good or to a resource available to all. Rather, it aims uh, to describe political principle in which common values, practices, etc., are to be constructed and protected uh, to defend the community's interests from the aggression of the ruling class. So, second argument that it challenged uh, narratives on technology held by a techno libertarian cypherpunk communities. So we have seen that the ME challenges uh, liberal discourses regarding data management and its related human rights implication. In this section, I want to argue that the ME also challenges, or at the very least nuances, uh, cypherpunk discourses about technology, namely by reaffirming the positive roles of the state in the protection of digital human rights. Uh, the cypherpunk community has long been advocated for a greater privacy through, amongst other things, the development of cryptographic tools and software for other people. Um, while they have done some really important work to secure the web and defend people's privacy and freedom of speech, uh, not only through the creation of tools, but also through legal battle and the yeah, jurisprudence, uh, the the community historically did so by engaging in uh, antagonic, antagonistic relationship with the state and by responsabilizing the individual and private companies, furthering a kind of libertarian agenda, putting their trust in technology and in the math rather than in institution that uh, could be corrupted. As we have seen, the Emmy's development is closely tied to the cypherpunk uh, and hacker community. But it challenges, or at the very least, as I said, nuance, the techno-determinism often attributed to these uh, communities. Um, by putting forward the idea that technology alone is not sufficient, um, it's not a sufficient answer it, and does not provide all the solutions to political and social problem. It moderates the trust in technology to focus on the information and social environment as a bigger picture. So by focusing on politically relevant speech, it also, um, f it addressed one specific problem and a place to start with. Indeed, um, as it protects information as public interest, it frames uh, issues related to privacy and freedom of speech uh, beyond the cypherpunk libertarian individual, individual rights frame. Finally, taking on the law problem rather than looking at solution within technical within technology, it helps situate a digital rights issue outside of the technological environment and to connect them more effectively with other rights and political provision. They basically bring digital issues into the real world. So in conclusion, uh, this presentation focused on describing the project to create a data haven uh, in Iceland as crafted by the IMI. Uh, we have seen how the political and legal provision challenge the discourses, some part of the discourses of big data and human rights and technology. Um, but it's important to say and to recognize that the ME seems to be profoundly rooted in a liberal tradition, uh, but that it still challenges and instrumentalizes numerous aspects of this ideology. So we can think of the conception of human rights and civil liberty, particularly the right to privacy and freedom of speech, that are being uh, re-articulated to promote the positive role of the state in their protection. Furthermore, by focusing on the protection of political speech and for the state, it tends to put forward the social and political dimension of privacy and freedom, um, presenting them as a common. Yet, the creation of a data haven has the objective to attract business, mostly uh, web hosting services, uh, by offering a unique legislative environment. Attracting those businesses uh, also means the mobilization and the potential construction of more and more data center. So it, it basically frames everything, uh, to the public at least, as some economic possibilities. So this position uh, 
can be seen as kind of ambiguous and um, shows that we need to investigate a lot more on the political economic side of uh, this project. On the one hand, the project is sold, as I said, to the population as a lucrative opportunity. And on the other hand, the members of the initiative clearly see their work as a human right compliant business model uh, that could be exported to other countries through uh, instrumentalizing the capitalist concept of competition. So, but even if the business model is focused on the promotion of human rights and civil liberties as a selling point, it's necessary, and uh, particularly when studying questions related to big data, to interrogate the ways in which this might be part of a bigger uh, data production complex. Following the research on industrial complex, namely uh, surveillance or security industrial complexes, data management is often related to a neoliberal project in which the industry of data production and web services and is more and more profitable every day. Hence, Hogan, Hogan theorizes the concept of data center industrial complex as the drive to pass from data saturation to a data surplus. Uh, so despite the provisions regarding data retention, developing an economy around data centers could participate in the strengthening of this complex. Uh, so to conclude, um, in this if this presentation focused on documentary research and preliminary interviews, one of its clear limitations is that it doesn't address key questions related to political economy of data um, and the technical aspects of the IMI. Uh, the present documentation, mostly focusing on representation of technology and human rights, uh, failed to identify the issues of data ownership and the specific provisions regarding the management of data center. Thank you.